Why don't you turn with me to book, book of Acts chapter 11, please. Acts chapter 11. Read just one verse and then get into what I, I want to share with you today. Now, <clears throat> this thing of how to be successful in ministry, I, I'm not up here to, to, today to promote myself as any kind of success or, or any kind of expert. Uh, you know, I... Uh, but maybe I can share some things with you that can be helpful uh, to you and your ministry and your lives and your Christian walk. Uh, personally, I think if we learn, if we, if we just try to live and be successful in, our, in life for the Lord, we're going to have a successful ministry, whatever it is. And by the way, everybody has a ministry of some kind. It's not just preachers and deacons and Sunday school. I mean, every, everybody has a ministry. Uh, where God's gifted you to do something that he created. Isn't, isn't it amazing? I was sharing with uh, the ladies in our office one day. I said, the, the great, uh, the thing amazing about God is there's nobody else exactly like us anywhere in the world. I mean, nobody exactly. God packaged every one of us individually, and he put in that package everything we need to be successful in, in our Christian life, ministry, and whatever we endeavor to do for him. That's the great thing about serving him. And uh, so I, I'm not here to be an expert. I, I, I did look up the definition. You know, it's just it's interesting me to see what the world, how the world defines some of these things. I looked up the definition of success. You, you ever just looked in Webster's? Let me tell you one thing I figured out about Webster's Dictionary. If that's the only place you go to find the definition of words, there'll be a lot of words you don't know the real meaning of. This is, what, this is what Webster's Dictionary, this is how it defines success. The fact of getting or achieving wealth, respect, or fame. That's how the world views success. And sad to say, that's how many in the church today view success. And I'm going to be honest with you, I, I, I have some friends who have all of those things. But they're miserable. Their life is a mess. I assure you, they wouldn't look at you and tell you that they feel like a success. So we're not talking about success in the way the world sees success. And so I got to thinking about this, and, and uh, I love Acts chapter 11. I love this, this story about Barnabas here. Uh, and in verse 24, just talking about Barnabas of Acts 11, it says, For he, Barnabas, was a good man. He was a good man. Have you ever noticed... In the Bible, how many people God calls good? Besides Jesus, there's only two men the Bible calls good. Barnabas here and then uh, Joseph of Arimathea who came and claimed the body of Jesus and put him in his new tomb. Those are the only two people, only two men in the Bible that God calls good. So I got to think about what does it mean to be good? What, what does that mean? Well, as far as the world looks at it and defines it, uh, matter of fact, this was, the, this was the oddest definition I've ever seen. Webster says, gives you, well, this is one of the definitions Webster gives you of the word good. He says it's a mysterious, a mysterious balance of good and evil. Oh, man, I just know everything now. Don't you? What, does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? A mysterious balance of good and evil and evil but i got thinking about what god calls good see what god calls good many times it's not what the world calls good i got thinking about that you know if you study you read after the church growth gurus and people tell you all these how to be successful ministry kind of guys uh, you, you know they they talk a lot about this thing about uh, you, you know in church growth you guys consider you know that the generation that's coming up now they they call them the, the nuns uh, and if you've read any of that, you've seen that. <clears throat> the nuns, they, they have no interest in church or, the, or God whatsoever. So they, they're called the nuns. Well, and then uh, we not only have the nuns, but in our churches, we have the duns. And, and, and at an alarming rate, people are leaving churches today. I mean, people who've been faithfully attending churches maybe for 20, 30, 40 years, and this now, just I mean, just to sign now, they're done with it, and, and they're gone. So we got the, the generation of the nuns coming along, and we got churches uh, with places that are empty because of the duns. But I told somebody today, I said they left an important group out. They actually left two important groups out. They left out a group, what I call the almost duns. 
Because there's some people I see sitting in the pews of our church across this country. They're just there in body only. Their life is in thoughts and mind is somewhere a long way off from where they're sitting in church that day. And if something doesn't change in their life, it's not going to be long before they're done and they're gone. So we got the nuns and we got the duns and we got the almost duns. But there's one other group that I want to be a part of. And that's that part I call the well duns. The well duns. Matthew 25, 21 says, His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou, notice, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. <laughs> Honestly, when I stand before him, whenever that time comes and I stand in his presence and hear what he has to say, if he says to me, well done, thy good and faithful servant, then I will have been a success. In life and in ministry. So I got to thinking about what are the attributes of a life that God, God calls good. Because if I just live a life that God calls good, then I will be a success in what he has me doing. And so I want to give you six simple attributes. Of, what, of the life that God calls good. This is all very simple. I like, I like simple. <laughs> That's why I love Jesus' teaching so much. It was simple, you know, and, and, and of course, Kenneth's already talked about stupid people, and, and uh, the sad thing is, we're, free old Baptists are not immune to stupid people coming to our churches. And, and uh, I told somebody, think about, you know, if, if a person's ignorant, you can help an ignorant person. They can be educated. But if a person's stupid, that's terminal. <laughs> they're going to die stupid, you know. <laughs> One fellow says even duct tape won't fix stupid. I said, well, if you put it over their mouth, at least it'll help. Amen. <laughs> but I, I like simple. I, I had, a, had a pastor friend of mine in Cookville, and I pastored in Cookville. We had <clears throat> a lot of uh, independent Fruit Baptist churches all around the Cookville area. And they weren't real high on educated preachers and a lot of things like that. But, uh, but I, I became dear friends with so many of those past priests in many of their churches. One of them one day came up to me. He said, Brother Crow, he says, you know why we like you so good? I said, I wouldn't have a clue. He said, it's because you got a good education, but you can't tell it. He said, now, I mean that as a compliment. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, I'm thinking I waste a lot of time and money going to school. But <clears throat> I like simple. I have some friends who apparently think it's a gift to take that which is simple and make it complicated. That's not a gift. The gift is to be able to take that which is simple or that which is complicated and make it simple or take that which is simple and keep it simple. That's the gift. But I want to just give you six attributes of the life that God calls good. First of all, if I want to live a life that's called good by God, number one, I must be godly. I mean, this is where it starts. There's no way in God's eyes I can be good without being godly. And there's no way I can be godly without knowing Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Because I have no godliness in my own right. I have no goodness in my own right. <clears throat> what goodness and godliness I have, I got from the Lord Jesus Christ. When he saved me and he cleansed me. Oh, listen, I received his righteousness. I received what he had done for me. So if I would be, <clears throat> if I would be good, as God calls good, I must be godly. Proverbs 12, 2 says this. A good man obtained favor of the Lord. The only way I can obtain God's favor is by living a godly life. God will bless a godly life. Now, even though I have no godliness of my own, I, I, I received Christ, but I, now God expects me to live godly. Every day of my life to do everything I can to do that which is right and stay away from that which is wrong. There's several things I pray every, every morning before I start anything else. There's specifically seven things I pray every morning. 
And uh, two of those are, one, I say, God, help me today not to do anything sinful. Then secondly, I say, God, help me today not to do anything stupid. Because there are some stupid things that are not necessarily sinful. And besides, Kim would call me stupid if I did some stupid things. But uh, I must be godly. Before I can even consider God consider me to be a good, faithful servant, I have to receive him and live for him. God expects us to live right. God expects us to make the right kind of decisions. God wants us to become more and more and more like him. The, di the most difficult thing we have, it seems, these days is to somehow, some way, every day to become less and less like the world and more and more like Christ. But that's the goal. So if I would want to be called good by God, I must be godly. Secondly, if I want to be called good by God, I must learn how to be gracious. Can I just be honest? One of the greatest needs in Free Will Baptist Church is today, we just need a, re a revival of graciousness. I mean, of just being kind and considerate and compassionate and loving toward one another. Uh, it's, it's sad to say that sometimes in, in church we get treated as worse than anywhere else we may go in this world. I, have things, I mean, you know, it's amazing to me the things people will say to you. Uh, you, you know, and, uh, and, you, and you're thinking, you know, that would have, you know, I'd have been okay if you'd have just kept that to yourself. And listen, <clears throat> standing out in the vestibule after services, and I have done that thousands of, listen, I've had just about everything you could imagine said to me. Some good, some bad, some I still don't know for sure whether it was good or bad. We need to learn how to be gracious. <clears throat> I love Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, we like to emphasize those first couple of verses. Be not conformed to this world, be, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why well, is that good and accept on perfect will of God? And we like to preach that and teach that, but we, we take that and we always then go talk about the outward things. But if you read the rest of that chapter, he's telling us, see, in, in that first two verses, he's begging us. God's begging us. Paul said, I beseech you, I beg you. He's begging us to do this. And, and it, basically, he's begging us to become less like the world, more like Christ every day. Less like the world, more like Christ. And then the rest of the chapter, he tells us how to do it. But it's all an inside thing. It's talking about things that are inward. And one of those is graciousness. And in, in, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, this is what he says. In honor preferring one another. Do you understand what that means? That means that if you got something I wanted, I should be glad for you. That when you rejoice, I can rejoice with you. When you weep, I can weep with you. Do you realize that the greatest example of graciousness we've ever been given was when Jesus preferred us over himself? When we deserved to die. When we were the ones who sinned. We were the ones who should have suffered. When he in honor preferred us over himself. That's the greatest example in all of time and eternity of graciousness. Oh, somehow, some way, we need to learn. Ask God to help us every day to learn how to be gracious people. And by the way, it's easy to be gracious to gracious people, but guess what? We're supposed to be gracious to people who are not gracious to us. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to be honest with you. We, we all have our moments. Now, don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we all have our moments. Uh, one of mine, I don't like mayonnaise. I mean, I really don't like mayonnaise. I got sick when I was a boy, and I don't know if mayonnaise made me sick or not, but I thought it did. I can smell it and, and just want to throw up. So Brad picks me up at the airport one day. They're in Nashville, and <clears throat> it's close to lunchtime. And <clears throat> so on the way to the office, we just pulled through the drive-thru of, uh, of a place there. And, and, uh, I, and of course, Brad knows, and I make sure he, he's re I remind him several times, please tell him no mayonnaise on my hamburger. Please, no mayonnaise. And he did. I heard him. That's what he told him. So we get the bag. We didn't check it. We, we go to the office. 
Well, I guess for some reason, I think it was just me and Brad and, and uh, Teresa Womack that may, maybe that were even in there that day for some reason at lunch. I guess everybody else was out doing other things. So we, we're in there. We sit down to have lunch in our in our lunchroom, and and uh, and when I opened my bag and took out my my hamburger, not only did it have mayonnaise on it, it had gobs of mayonnaise on it. It was oozing out the side. Now, I promise you, I was throwing at the garbage can. I, I promise you. I wrapped it up, and I threw it. The thing was, the garbage can was all the way across the room. And I promise you, I was throwing. I was aiming at the garbage can. I wrapped it, but as that thing flew through the air, the paper just kind of comes off of it. And that thing hits the wall. And just slides down the wall, leaving a strip of mayonnaise, a greasy spot right down. down. And Brad and Teresa just get, they're not saying one word. Is it? We all have our moments and times that we, we're not very gracious. And I do want to be a gracious man. I, I, I want to be gracious to my family. I meet some people that treat other people a lot better than they treat their own family. Sad to say, sometimes that's people in ministry. We need to be gracious to our family. Can I I tell you one thing I never did as a pastor and preacher? I never made jokes from the pulpit at the expense of my wife and children. They don't deserve that. They deserve better than that. We just learn to be, just to treat each other with, with kindness and, and just to be, and if you, if you were asked the, these guys in the ladies, what, what do you hear Brother David Crow say is more than anything else? They may say two things. One is I'll, they'll, they'll ask about something, I'll say anything for you. And then I'll say, now I know I tell everybody, but I mean it when I tell you. But the other thing I, I, I'm pretty sure they'll tell you is I always say it never hurts to be nice to people. Never hurts to be nice to people. You'll be amazed at what God will do in your life and the lives of others around you if you'll just try to practice that every day. First thing, godly. If I'm going to be considered good by God, called good by God, I must be godly. Secondly, I must learn how to be gracious, to in honor prefer others over myself. The third thing is, if I would be called good by God, I must learn how to be genuine. Still in Romans 12, verse 10 was where I pulled that verse in honor, preferring one another, the graciousness. The next, the verse right before it, verse 9 says, let love be without dissimulation. Let love be without dissimulation. That, that word dissimulation, we don't use that a whole lot, I guess, in, in, in conversation today. <clears throat> but the, the Greek word uh, that's translated to this English word, there is, a, there is a word in English that is derived from the Greek word, and it's the word hypocrite. Or hypocrisy. So he's saying love without hypocrisy. In other words, be genuine. Be real. Be who the person God created you to be. And be that person to everybody that God brings into your life. To love others in a genuine way. The world is dying to see Christians just be genuine and real. We see so many fakes. We see so many copies we see so many pretenders and so many hypocrites god wants us to be genuine and real in 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 church and on the job and at school and at home to be listen one of the greatest my mother i learned so many valuable lessons from my mother didn't know i was learning at the time but uh, as, as i've grown and began to understand the dynamics of my childhood and teenage life and the lessons I learned. I learned a lot of lessons from my mom. My, my mom was born in Detroit, not Michigan. That's Detroit. She was born in Detroit, Alabama. And my mother was a redneck. Now, she was a classy redneck. She was a saved redneck. There's a big difference. But the thing about my mother, no matter who she was around, she was going to be who she was. I learned from my mother, it's okay to be the person God created you to be. Oh, I meet so many young preachers that need to get a hold of that. 
one, one, of the, one of the happiest days of my life in ministry was when I finally figured out I didn't have to be some other preacher. I didn't have to preach like them or, or dress like them or <clears throat> be like them. God just wants me to be the best me that he's created me to be. And, and he just wants me to be genuine and real. Listen, people need to know that, that uh, and see a, a, a genuineness of your life. To me, the greatest compliment anybody ever gives me is they'll just say, Brother David, just seems so genuine. I said, well, I sure hope and pray it's not just something that it seems to be that way. I want my life to be open and, and, and genuine and real uh, before God and before everyone else. If I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. If I would be called good by God, I must be godly. I must be gracious. And I need to learn how to be genuine. And by the way, to love, to written. You know, it's easier to talk about loving people than it is to do it. Because you understand there's some people that are hard to love. And some of them go to church. And some of them think it's their gift to make it hard for us to love them. So it'll help us to love them, you know, learn how to love. Because some of them work very hard at making, I mean, some people are just hard to love. But it doesn't matter. You know, the Bible even goes as far as to say, love your enemies. Wow. <laughs> We're supposed to love our enemies. How in this world can we not at least love everybody in church? Uh, whether we like what they do or not, whether they're nice to us or not, gracious to us, whether they love us back or not. Our son Ryan, he's turned 30 years old in April. His wife Kelly lived in Seattle, Washington. When he was about 19 years old, he started running we don't know if he was running from God or what he thought God wanted him to do or if he was running from me and his mother or, or, or just running from himself we're not sure but he thought it would be a good idea just to live out of his car you know and travel across the country and so for quite a long quite a few months a year or more that's what he did and many many times we we'd be months before we'd hear from him and he'd finally get to where he could call us and and let us know he's okay and um, this has been about 20 years, I mean, about 10, 11 years ago when this took place. And he only told me this part of it just about a year ago. He said, Dad, as I was out traveling across the country, he said most of the time I, I, w I didn't have access to places to get a shower, wash my clothes, or get a haircut. And he said, I'd be going through a town and I'd see a free old Baptist church. And I'd recognize the name of that church. Because I'd heard you talk about going there to preach. And he says, well, if it was anywhere close to a church time, I would just stay there. And, and then I'd go in and just sit in the back of those churches. He said, Dad, I, I'm sure I didn't smell too good. And I'd probably look pretty ragged. He said, Every time I did that, not one person came and shook my hand and said, we're so glad to have you in our church. He said, now if I'd have told them who my daddy was, they'd have been all over me. And I said, son, that shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter who your daddy is. He said, dad... I had seen you so many times as a pastor. It didn't matter who came in off the street or from the parking lot, whether it was a banker, a doctor, a truck driver, a waitress, or a homeless person off the street. You'd shake their hand and hug their neck and say, we're so glad you came to our church today. I said, son, please don't tell me the names of those churches because I don't want to know because it would be hard for me to have the right kind of feeling. See, we got to love folks, and it's got to be a genuine, real love because I'm going to tell you, people can spot a phony a mile off. Well, if I'd be called good by God, I need to learn how to be genuine. 
Fourth thing, if I want to be called good by God, I need to learn how to be generous. Chapter 12, verse 8. By the way, there's a lot in chapter 12. You can read that before you go to bed tonight again and just, just see all that's there again. Verse 8 says to give with simplicity. To give with simplicity. Wow. That literally translates to give with generosity. It's interesting, the definition of that word generous, it, it actually uh, came to us, came to the English fr uh, fr from the French and the Latin and it, and it literally means to, to be ready to give more of something than is necessary or expected. To be willing to give more of something that is beyond just being necessary or expected. It's to be liberal. This is one of the few places it's okay for a free will Baptist to be liberal. <laughs> is in our generosity. It comes from that Latin word generosus, and what it had reference to was royal, being of royal birth. Do you understand, when, when I am generous to others, that I, that's when I come the closest to being of royal birth. Now, my, my father wasn't a king or a prince. None of his relatives were. Uh, most of them were, were sharecroppers over the year, didn't have much of anything. But you see, when I got saved, I became a part of a royal family. We are royalty in him. And as royalty, we should act as such. And the greatest act of royalty is generosity. Now, I'm not just talking about giving up your things, your possessions. I'm talking about giving up your time and your talent. Sometimes the greatest gift you can give somebody is to give them some of your time. My wife, Kathy, is one of the most generous people I know. Time... That is hers. That belongs to her. Time with me. For years she has given away. Given away time that was rightly hers. It's my wife. Given away time that I, I, she could have had me with her. But she's given away time for years to others. So I could come. Maybe somehow, some way, be a help and a blessing to you. You do understand, I'm here on time that's been given by her. Of course, now I've found after all these years of traveling, if I'm home more than two or three days at a time, she'll say, uh, David, haven't you got somewhere you need to go? Because <laughs> I mess, you know, she has her own routine. I mess up the routine when I'm home. But I'm talking about being gentle. I'm talking about being willing to, to, to give, to give. Think about how generous God's been to you. Listen, Kathy and I realize and understand everything, you hear me, everything we have, God gave us. We do not possess one thing that he didn't give us. And everything he gave us, we're but the stewards of it. We are the overseers of it. He has a right to tell us what to do with anything and everything he's given us. One of the greatest things I found out in, in this, this thing of the Christian life and ministry, it's amazing to me to see, watch how God blesses generosity. Now, I think I always believe that it's better to give than receive. But boy, once I really started asking God to help me to practice it, to help me to put it, to, to actually do it, I have, I, and now that's become a real, it's not just something I read or I hear or I think, it's something that God has, been, it's been, become a reality in my life that, that it is better, it is more, it, it's more enjoyable, it, 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 it's, it's just better to give than to receive. And I'll tell people, I said, now, I know you're blessed by, by receiving it, but, but, I, 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 but I'm going to tell you, you can't be any more blessed by receiving it than I've been by giving it. We, we need to learn how to be, you know, to be generous, you have to learn to let go of things. Now, some people, and by the way, a second lesson my mother taught me, not only it's okay to be who, who you are, who God created you to be, it's okay who you be who you are. She also taught me that you don't have to be rich to be generous. You just have to understand it's, it's all his and learn not to get too tight a hold on it because one of these days we're going to turn loose of all of it anyway. 
You hear me? It's, we're turning loose of all of it one day. I've decided I'm just going to not get that too tight a hold on it now. Uh, now, be careful if you pray and ask God to help you be generous. He may give you opportunities to do so. And he may put on your heart to give away something you'd rather keep. You know how most people give? They give you something that's already they've already worn out. Or they don't want any more. They're tired of. Or they've got to know one just like it. That, that's how we tend to give. Anybody can give those, those kind of gifts. But when, when God puts on your heart to give away something you'd like to keep. <laughs> I remember a couple of years ago I, <clears throat> I obtained a, a nice guitar. I, I collect instruments and a lot of instruments. Grew up around instruments. My father and brother, sister, they play and sing. and uh, travel, uh, For many years sang as the group called uh, Sugar Creek Gospel. And uh, uh, so, so I like instruments. And I, ha I had obtained a uh, 1954 Martin D28 guitar. Brazilian rosewood back in size. And if you play guitar, you'd be the only one here probably knows what any of this means. It's the kind of guitar that these bluegrass flat pickers today, now they wouldn't give an arm for it, they couldn't play, but they at least they probably would give a leg for one because that's the tone they're looking for. And unless, oh, the first time I strummed it, oh, mm, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I, so I told Kathy, I said, Kathy, I'm going to kind of act like I don't like this so God won't make me give it away. She looked at me, she said, so you think you're fooling God. <laughs> Don't you hate it, guys, when your wife is right? <laughs> I'm just saying, if I want to be called good by God, I need to learn to be generous. He was generous enough to give us his son. His son was generous enough to give us his life. Surely we can become generous serving him. The fifth thing, not only must I be a godly, gracious, genuine, generous, if I would be called good by God. The fifth thing is, if I'm going to be called good by God, I must be a guided person. I must let God guide me. Psalms 37, 23 says this, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. If I want God to call me good, I've got to follow his directions down here. I've got to walk every footstep I take, every decision I make needs to be guided by him. You see, we only ask others to follow us as we follow Christ. We follow in his footsteps. God has ordered, listen, you hear me? He has ordered our lives. He knows what's best for us. And even through those times he leads us, we do not understand. We can't see the other side. God already knows the other side. It's okay to follow him in the dark. It's okay to follow him in the valleys because he's seen beyond the dark and he's seen beyond the valley and he's seen beyond the troubles and he's seen beyond the trials and he sees beyond the heartaches and the sorrow of today. Follow his steps. You follow his steps, you'll never make a misstep when you follow his steps. If I would be called good by God, I must let God guide me. I must be guided. And then the sixth thing and final thing, I must be a guarded man. If I would be called good by God, my life must be guarded. Matthew 12, 35 says this. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth Good things. Wow. It is important what we let come in through our eyes and our ears. It is important because everything we see and hear goes directly into our hearts and lives. If I want to bring good things out of my heart, as the scripture says here, a good man brings good things out of his heart. The only way I can bring good things out is, is if I've put good things in. You're gonna, all that's going to come out is what you put in. So that's why we need to be careful <clears throat> what we put in. I have a, <clears throat> kind of have a policy when I travel, especially by myself, uh, in a hotel room. I, I rarely ever turn on the television uh, for several reasons. One, uh, not much on worth watching to start with. 
And two, before you realize, you can waste a lot of time sitting there watching things that have no, no, absolutely no significance or importance whatsoever. But the main reason is this. One night late, close to midnight, I, I drove in and I, to a hotel there. I had a reservation, and I check in, and <clears throat> I go <clears throat> open the door, and I step in the room. I set my bags down, and uh, I just walk over and, and hit the, rem the power button on the remote to turn on the television. There had been some bad weather. I was going to see if there's any threatening weather around, and so just to turn it on. Now, I, I don't know if the people who were in there before me had rented a movie and didn't watch it all or if it was just on a particular channel. All I know is when it came on, I mean the awfulest mess of pornography <clears throat> you, you could imagine. And so, listen, man, I got that thing turned off as fast as I could in about 15 or 20 minutes. And <laughs> I'm just seeing if you're awake this morning. <clears throat> if you're listening, no, I got it turned off as quick as I could. But I'd already seen it. And so out loud, I said, Satan, you got me. But I'm not giving you that opportunity again. Don't you understand something? My wife trusts me. She trusts me. One, because I've never given her any reason not to. And I don't intend to start now. And then I think she knows that I understand my wife's got some redneck in her. Classy redneck. Save redneck. My wife told me one day, she said, David, I just thought you might want to know. I don't believe in divorce, but I don't have any problem with murder. <laughs> and I said, that's good to know. <laughs> Thank you. Good to know. I'm just saying, we need to be careful. We need to guard our lives. Listen, we are living a life that Jesus gave his life for us to have. How dare we not guard it from that which is evil and sinful and wretched? How dare us fill our hearts and minds with those things we know are not pleasing to God? Well, I don't know about you, but I, I want good things coming out of my mouth. I want good things coming out of my heart, out of my life. And I've learned, though, the only way that's going to happen is as I put good things in there. Good things in there. Well... That was number six. And I want to share one last thing with you, and then I'm done. Okay, on time, yeah. I told you I pray. There's seven things I pray every morning. Now, it's not all that thing I pray. It's just how I start my day. I, I pray for many other things throughout the day as God puts on my heart, as needs become known to me and those kind of things. But these seven things I pray every morning. The first one has to do with godliness. And I'll say, Lord, help me today to become more like you than I was yesterday. Second has to do with generosity. I say, Lord, help me to see the opportunities you give me to help supply what might be lacking in the lives of those I meet today. Third has to do with graciousness. God, help me to always be gracious, even to those who may not be gracious to me today. The fourth has to do with genuineness. Lord, help me to live today with no pretense, no hypocrisy, and be the person you created me to be. The fifth one has to do with gratitude. I say, Lord, help me not today to take for granted your many blessings in my life. The sixth has to do with guarding. Help me today, Lord, by guarding my life so that I don't do anything sinful today. The second has to, seventh has to do with guidance. And it's just simply say, God, help me today by guiding my steps so I don't do anything stupid today. And then I say, thank you, Lord, for another day to serve you. And if you allow me to see tomorrow, help me to do it all over again. He deserves us to live a good life. The attributes of a life God calls good. Well done. Thou good. He didn't say successful. He said, thou good and faithful servant. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, I love you. 
Lord, you know my heart. You know my life. You know what I am when I'm standing in this place. You know what I am when I'm in a hotel room by myself a thousand miles away from my wife. You know me. Above everything else in my life, God. Oh, yes, I, I want Kathy to feel like she has a good husband. I want my children to feel like they have a good father. I want my grandson to feel like they got a good papa. And Lord, I, I do want people to think I'm good. But God, more than all of that, when I stand before you, and you know it all. And I hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. <laughs> then I will have been a success for you. In Jesus' name, amen.